from, from someone there. We so, can hear you, Derek, loud okay. and clear. Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Excellent. Well, great. Thanks so much, uh, everyone, for joining us for part two of the Ocean View webinar series. Uh, we're going to get started uh, now. And uh, yesterday, you know, we uh, had a, a great presentation from Yvette, and this is just to kind of continue on with that that same topic of how powerful Ocean View can be for your various spectroscopy applications. Uh, so my name is Derek Gunther. Uh, I've been with Ocean Insight for, uh, it'll be 12 years in September, hopefully I didn't just jinx myself, but my uh, background is in chemical engineering and I really enjoy working with chemical systems and I really enjoy working uh, with numerical methods for spectroscopy and really doing uh, uh, the, the ad advanced analysis to, to pull apart things that are otherwise unseen and, or unseeable in spectral data. So uh, we're going to talk about what Ocean View can do today uh, in the schematic. We're going to kind of fly through the wizard aspect and really the main part of the presentation will be a demo where we're going to going to build from scratch a solution analyzer, a nickel chloride uh, plating bath uh, a concentration monitor. And you're going to see a couple different ways that you can do that um, using even external files being loaded into uh, Ocean View for calibration. So it's, it's pretty cool. So let's start with a recap from uh, yesterday. So hopefully everyone can see my window uh, or the presentation screen here. So uh, yesterday we went through or Yvette gave an excellent presentation that talked about window management, how you can set up views exactly how you want them in Ocean View went through acquisition controls, all the key parameters you have to set up. So you have good uh, measurement uh, parameters there, including averaging, box car, integration time, so you're not saturating, data logging options, a lot of options in there, so you can send data where you want it and how you want it at the intervals or thresholds that are meaningful to you, strip charting for time resolved studies, and I'm going to minimize this here for you guys. And also re-referencing so that your uh, your values that you're getting are as valid as possible and as meaningful as possible. So these are all very critical tools, and they give you uh, what you need to do all the standard tasks that you would expect to do uh, in a spectroscopy laboratory and, and to do those those types of uh, analysis. But what about deeper analysis and complex processing? If you want to really add a, a, a level of complexity to your measurements or to your analysis and automate that within the software, that's what Ocean View can do. And we're going to talk about that uh, starting by looking at the wizard. So the wizard is what pops up when you uh, click on the Ocean View icon in the upper left corner of the software, and you get this menu of nine items that pops up right in front of you. And ever since we did the rebranding from Ocean Optics to Ocean Insight, I've reflected a lot on what that means and, and, the, and the name. And two, three things that, that jump out that we offer as Ocean Insight today are our hardware, our techniques, and our insight. And the hardware is exactly that. It's the modular hardware that everyone knows and loves for the last 25 years. From, uh, from the Ocean brand. Uh, the, the, in, the techniques are exactly what you see here, which are the nine things that uh, Ocean View presents to you. So you can use all these different spectral techniques, whether it be Raman or absolute irradiance. And then the insight is what we're bringing to you with this webinar, which is our years of expertise and, uh, and that, that ability to uh, apply the techniques in a very uh, significant way. So th this is what you're presented with, and we're going to run through these kind of quickly because, again, we're kind of building up to the demo portion. So this won't be, you know, a, a lesson on Beer's Law or all the individual uh, theories behind these. But we're just going to talk through what it'll uh, put you through in the wizard. So to start off, we're going to talk about the, what we call the art functions or absorbance, reflectance and transmission. Uh, that's definitely going to be the most popular and most common techniques used. Uh, in spectroscopy uh, in any laboratory. I mean, this is your high school chemistry, you know, when you're doing the uh, Beer's Law check and, and all that and learning about that. So these are very popular techniques. They're so popular, we actually made devoted freeware for it. And you can go on our website right now, oceaninsight.com, and download for free software called Ocean Art. You can guess what the art stands for. And this allows you to do those three basic processing modes, uh, and that's it. Uh, and it still lets you do data logging and some basic graph manipulation and, and basic tasks. But if you aren't looking for a whole lot of deep 
processing and you don't need uh, the absolute irradiance and color tools and all those things, ocean art may be great for you. So that's just something to keep in mind. So when you run through these in the wizard, they all start you with an acquisition setup. So you have to uh, set up exactly what Yvette showed you yesterday, which was setting your averaging uh, to be, uh, I guess, the, the proper level for the, the application at hand. The boxcar width, of course, making sure that you have smoothing that is uh, enough to where you're getting a nice smooth spectrum, but you're not losing resolution for, let's say, really uh, sharp peak activities that you might uh, drown out with too high a boxcar. Uh, and, uh, and likewise with your integration time, so you're not saturating the detector there. And then it's going to ask you for a light reference. So it needs some sort of reference value. And for all three of these are, are processed against some sort of reference condition. So we like to set that up in the most illuminated condition. So let's say if you're having a set of samples um, and that are a, a reflection standard, let's say you want a reflection standard that is going to give you the most light back to your detector. And then the flip of that is the dark reference, which is going to take a snapshot in the dark condition. Uh, and that may not be perfectly dark. You may want to take a dark with the lights on if you're going to be doing the measurements with your room lights on, meaning not, not the, uh, not the um, light source lights, but let's say the, uh, the ambient lights. The dark is meant to, to knock out any sort of unwanted uh, signal that isn't coming from your light source or the, the main optical chain. So it runs you through these three acquisitions. So what does it do with these values then once it gets light and dark references? So for absorbance, this is the, the equation for absorbance. So it's looking at the ratio of the, the reference intensity versus the live feed intensity, uh, dark corrected, put through a, a log term. So you can see that I naught here, if you can see my mouse cursor, this is going to be your light reference that you took. This I dark is going to be your dark reference that you took. The um, I here is just your live spectrometer intensity. And these are all across uh, all the wavelengths for the spectrometer. So this is a broadband acquisition. And then that's put through a log term and that's your absorbance. Now transmission is looking at that same basic ratio, uh, but it has this term on the bottom here. So this is essentially just a percentage. So it's percent transmission of the dark corrected live feed over the, uh, the, reference, uh, the dark corrected reference feed multiplied by 100. And the reflectance measurements, the exact same thing as the transmission. But what does this tell you then about your sample? Again, without going into a bunch of uh, uh, theory of, of what Beer's law is and all that, we know that absorbance is telling us concentration through that Beer's law relationship, where we should have a more or less linear uh, trend following uh, the absorbance that we see uh, as a function of the concentration of solution. So this is actually looking at some pH, uh, a pH dive, Roman crystal green, at some different uh, alkalinity or acidity levels, I should say. Uh, and we're looking at that change as a function of, the, of changing a concentration. For transmission, it's showing you how much light gets through. So this is uh, some medical tubing that we were testing to see how much UV light was getting through uh, one of the standards and one of the darker pieces. Uh, through a transmissive setup. And then reflection tells you how much light is bouncing back. So this is actually a, a sample of raw ore, some mineral ore that went into a steel manufacturing process. It actually got melted into the steel uh, stock. And uh, this is, you can see the purple dot right there. That's a UV reflection measurement um, off that to determine the composition uh, of that uh, mineral, which is a very interesting project actually to do. We did a whole UV vis near analysis on a bunch of rocks uh, for that. So you can learn a whole lot uh, from just those techniques. Now, how about Raman and fluorescence? I say here that they're so different yet so similar. So they are very different from a physics perspective. What's happening at the quantum level, I don't want to say that they're the same because they aren't. Um, but from a broader logistical handling uh, perspective, they are very similar, and you're going to see why. Uh, they're both going to take you through the acquisition setup the exact same uh, way, where you're going to set up the spectrometer uh, in the best mode possible for that application. But they're not going to take a light reference, because these aren't working off of a, a, a ratio to some reference spectrum. They're really just looking at an emission. So why I say they're very similar is the sense that you're in each case you are pumping in some 
excitation energy, the photons, and then you're looking at some other emission at other wavelengths, at other uh, energy levels there. And for Raman, it's going to be a laser, so you're going to have a very tight uh, wavelength of photons being pumped in, and you're looking for that Raman shift at, at higher wave numbers as a result. Fluorescence might use a laser, but more commonly uses an LED, or you could use a, a filtered broadband source. That's not terribly uncommon uh, either by any means. So in that sense, they're still handling uh, the, the light in the same way, and they do need a dark reference for that same reason that we took one before with the art measurements in that we want to knock out any influence from uh, background uh, ambient lighting or other fluorophores, things like that that might be uh, jumping into the spectrum that we don't want. Now, the Raman wizard gives you one extra step, and that's setting the laser wavelength. And the reason you do that is because the Raman uh, x-axis is going to be presented in wave numbers or inverse centimeters. But this is a different, I just want to make a comment here that uh, the wave numbers for Raman are different than wave numbers you see when dealing with uh, uh, infrared or, or mid-IR spectroscopy, because those are wave numbers that are inherent to the wavelength of energy, uh, whereas a, a Raman wave number is a, a function of that laser wavelength. So here we're setting at 785. So 785 nanometers is going to be called zero uh, wave numbers and everything's going to go up from there. If we were doing this at 532 or 1064, it would call that that wavelength zero wave numbers and everything would build from there. So just want to make a, a, a distinction between those because that can be confusing uh, for folks. Uh, we sell oxygen sensors as well and the same thing comes up with the PPM and PPB units where folks working in uh, environmental water analysis are talking about PPM. It's very different than folks talking about PPM and industrial gases. Uh, so same thing here with uh, uh, wave numbers is it's a little different for Raman. The clean peaks option, if you clicked on, on this option down here for clean peaks, what that's going to do is snap everything that it doesn't determine as a peak to the baseline. So you get a very nice, uh, clean view of peaks that are statistically significant. Uh, I think it's a three sigma uh, threshold over the, um, the standard deviation of the, of the baseline region. So everything above that is going to be registered as a peak. So you get very nice, clean outputs of that. So let's look at the calculations, likewise for these. Very simple, way easier than the absorbance or the other stuff. It's just the intensity uh, minus the uh, dark intensity. So your live intensity minus dark. And this is why I said they're so similar. The fluorescence is doing the exact same uh, calculation there. And what is that telling us about our sample? With Raman, you're going to get uh, a lot of sharp fingerprint peaks uh, that are uh, emissions inherent to that sample. So you can see here we get very sharp lines that are specific to that analyte. And that can be done at the bulk level, and it can be even down, be done down to the trace level. Now, if you were to need to detect something at the part per billion level, sometimes part per trillion level, you can use our the Ocean Insight surface enhanced Raman substrates here that you can see on the left. This uses a, uh, an, uh, there's two options there. It uses colloidal gold and or silver uh, in a proprietary matrix, and this will notably enhance this Raman signal. We're talking many orders of magnitude, up to a million times enhancement uh, of these peaks. So if you need to detect things that are kind of trickier, uh, like explosives or pesticides, you can use these substrates to really pump up that, uh, that signal to, for trace level analysis for both uh, qualification and quantification. Now, fluorescence is uh, a little different. You're gonna get broader emissions usually out, out of fluorescence. So again, nothing's 100% of the time, but usually they're, they're broader. Um, folks working in uh, life sciences will know that uh, a lot of that, those life science um, uh, proteins and DNA, they're, they're going to overlap each other a, a good bit uh, there and um, in, in that sense, you may not be able to differentiate, but if you know what's in your system and you're confident there isn't stuff from the outside world walking itself in to there, it can still be a very meaningful measurement. As we see here, we're looking at uh, different concentration levels of a, uh, this was a, a polymer, actually a monomer uh, in a process and looking at the fluorescence 
as a function of concentration, and it's very nice uh, uh, change there. This is actually this gift that you're seeing in the upper right is actually phosphorescence, which is similar to fluorescence, but we'll call it the uh, the f orbital cousin of um, of fluorescence, a little slower, and uh, it's using our 365 nanometer LED. There's a little mound right there, so as we bring the UV light into there, there it glows. Uh, green. That's the same stuff they put in the glow in the dark uh, stuff, like the, the bouncy balls and things. So before we get into the irradiance and photometry, I should preface and say I'm not an expert uh, in this by any means. I, I've spent most of my years working with everything we've talked about so far, the Zorbins, Raman, all that stuff. But uh, this is really something that's uh, pertinent to folks that work with uh, lighting characterization or environmental characterization or uh, uh, figuring out metrology around optical components. Um, so these tools still exist in Ocean View, and that's the main point is to show you that uh, while I don't know a lot about it, it exists there. So if it's meaningful to you, it, it's something that you can jump on. Uh, so if you were to go through an absolute irradiance calibration, that's going to call for an irradiance calibration file. As you can see, that's where you would input that there. And it also then gives you the option to specify if you were using an integrating sphere, a known collection area over uh, you know some, some square centimeter, or a fiber at some known diameter, like I've put in 450 micron there. Or it's going to ask for a lamp file. Um, when doing this absolute irradiance uh, setup. Now, the photometry and energy uh, wizard is literally going to take you through that same process as absolute irradiance. But the relative irradiance is going to ask you for uh, light source color temperature, um, which uh, is uh, either something you know from your own source or you have a table such as here uh, from Ocean Insight products that list this, for example, the HL2000s, 2500 Kelvin there. And all these still begin with an acquisition setup, just as all of them. That's the main point here is to show you that you're always going to be setting up the spectrometer as the first step uh, in the wizard, no matter what you pick, essentially. And you're not going to be putting in a light reference with the uh, irradiance calibration file if that's used, because that's assumed um, to be there. And you can't really see down here, but all this is, says is light reference and dark reference. Um, but uh, you are going to be using a dark reference for all of these so that, again, to knock out anything unwanted from the uh, ambient conditions. So color is really the last, uh, so the last option or selection in that wizard uh, interface. And this is another huge world that I don't know, I will admit, don't know a whole lot about, but when you dive into, and you see some of these slides and snapshots I took, and you dive into this yourself, you will quickly find that it's, it's almost intimidating how much is in there uh, and how much can be done for different folks working in different uh, worlds of, of application. So, when you're going through that wizard, you're going to notice, like I said, a whole range of both inputs and outputs available. So for the inputs, you can see you can work in a percent reflection, you can work in your relative irradiance, you can work in absolute irradiance, or you can work in some existing mode that you've already got going and jamming in the software. The guy had a relative irradiance uh, down here already going. But look at the outputs. You can do all of this in a chromaticity diagram and then table outputs as well. You can set the observer to a, a two degree or a 10 degree uh, vantage point there. The illuminant is set. I picked the, um, the D55, which I assume is some daylight uh, iteration. There's a whole big drop down list of illuminant options in there. So this is a very well developed interface for color measurements that again, I'm not the expert in. Uh, but is is there if that is something that you work with a lot. And one thing I want to mention that we make, this is a little bit of a, a self-advertisement here for uh, Ocean Insight product, is the, uh, the WaveGo portable spectrometer. So this is from a business unit that's part of Ocean Insight called the Wave Illumination Group. And this is a, uh, you can see this device in the upper right corner. This is really cool. This is a, a little miniature uh, device with a our one of our high performance miniature spectrometers inside and a cosine corrector. And this won the Red Dot Design Award in uh, 2019 last year. And it's very powerful in doing these types of color measurements in uh, ambient environmental 
conditions. So you can use Ocean View with this device. So you can plug this into your computer and use all the Ocean View color measurements with this device, or you can use iOS and Android apps. So you can see there some snapshots of the applications that run right on your phone for that. Now, folks are going to use this for a number of things. One of the applications is uh, ambient lighting, as I said, for, let's say, a high-end uh, store. Let's say a Louis Vuitton store or Target is a good example. Target actually puts a lot of money into making sure that, that psychologically you know that you're in a Target from the lighting, from the smell, from everything, that how it's laid out. They want you to kind of fall into that target pocket when you're walking to that store. And this is a good way to quantify what that, that ambient environment feels like to a person and then replicate it at other stores. Or in the world of horticulture and agriculture, if you're growing plants that need a very specific, let's say, a regime of different light energies across their life cycle, this is a way to characterize that and, and you can uh, make some really cool measurements and set up some really cool automated processes with that. So with, and then here's one of the outputs too before we get into the next thing. So this is what Ocean View looks like uh, when you run all of that color uh, wizard through. So you get the chromaticity diagram and you get all these different table values there. So this is what we were building to. Um, and I know we're supposed to stop at uh, 2.30, but we're gonna go a little longer because this is a cool demo that we're building up to here. So what did all this do to the schematic window? If we ran through the absorbance wizard and uh, looked at the schematic window after the fact, this is what we'd see. This is what was built by the, the software. And look at our absorbance equation. We have exactly that. I naught minus I dark is this. That's our reference intensity minus, there's the minus block, the background intensity, and then I minus I dark is this subtraction right there. Actually, let's go back there. Where it's the live feed minus your background divided by one another, put through a log term. Now to flip it, so it's in this actual orientation, this K block, this constant block is actually a negative one. So that's multiplied. And then we do a absorbance unit labels on there and then a graph view. So it just builds that for you automatically. Now the Raman view uh, we said was very simple. It's just your intensity minus the dark and that's exactly what we see here. We have the live feed and then our background reference spectrum and they're just subtracted, you know, the uh, live minus the background, put the Raman shift unit labels on there and then there's your Raman shift plot. For color, I say down here, just ask Scott uh, Kachalik. He's the head of the Wave Illumination Group, and uh, or check the old Ocean View documentation because that's going to have some info <clears throat> in there as well about the uh, color. But look at what it builds for color for all this. It builds this whole processing and then all these different outputs. So the point of this is these are great starting points for customization. That if you want to set up something that needs an absorbance flow, don't go block by block or node by node building it yourself just run through a wizard and use that as a starting point because it's going to build that foundation for you and this is a very similar interface to uh if you've used lab view or simulink and matlab i used to build tons of simulink flows for uh, uh auto controls and stuff and that was a really powerful interface as well and this is very similar to that and you get a huge library of functions so you've got all of these here. Check this out, Raman, all these different math things. And they, they fan out into, uh, like Raman gives you sample matching. For constant, you can do data property and unit labels. Basic math, look at all this stuff you can do for basic math. Add, subtract, logs, natural log, exponent, standard deviation. So let's say you want to do your own baseline analysis and have a three sigma uh, over some sub range of a known baseline. You can do that right into this flow. So Without going through all of them, let's just jump to the demo. Let's run through them. So here's what we're going to do. Hopefully you can still see my whole screen. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I want to bring up the share. Um, all right, here we go. So I'm going to share. Share my screen again. And then 
Hopefully my camera's on too. I'm not sure if anyone can see me. Um, but uh, let's see. But if you can uh, see me at all, there is uh, this device, uh, which is one of our flame yes, chem systems. Ignore the uh, the ocean optics logo. It's just what we have from our working from home scenario. And what we're going to do is is build a. Uh, I think I have that. Yeah, that's on. So what we're going to do is build a, a basic absorbance measurement system uh, that gives us the concentration of. And again, I'm not sure if you can see this since my camera's on, but these solutions, which are nickel chloride solutions. So let's say that we're, uh, the application here is a nickel plating bath. So we're doing uh, electroplating of nickel onto different materials. And, and we want to have a nickel plating bath that's achieving 40 grams per liter of nickel chloride in solution. So we're gonna go ahead and, and I've got all these uh, made up, some different cuvettes of, of solutions, and we're gonna put them into this uh, simple device. Now this has the spectrometer, the light source, and then the cuvette holder. So these just pop right in, just like so. And so if we go ahead and turn on, let's set up an absorbance measurement. Let's watch how fast this goes. So we're gonna turn the, the lamp on. So let's put in our water reference. I'm gonna pop in a water. And let's bring this to 40. Let's do scans to average maybe five and boxcar like 10 that's a nice round number and look at that we got a nice smooth spectrum there and that's our light source so now let's go through an absorbance setup we click on our uh wizard icon go to the absorbance now you have some options here these will kind of uh give you a little cleaner um labeling outputs and so on but we're going to do it ourselves so i want to show you that just like i said we're going to start with the acquisition parameters <clears throat> we're going to take our light reference, took that snapshot. We're going to take our dark reference. Let's turn off the light source. There it goes. We take our dark right there. All right. And then we're going to, and we turn that back on. We're going to finish. And now we're in absorbance view. Now let's throw in one of our 80 gram per liter samples, which is right here. Look at that, very nice. So just to comment on the graph here, now let's let's adjust this view, let's bring, take this to zero. There we go, that looks nice. So obviously we're getting a whole lot of activity, absorbance activity here at 400, and then uh, kind of a double hump here at, uh, what will that look like, 650 and about 725, 720 or so. And note that we don't have any more light anymore here because it's all been absorbed for the most part down in the uh, in the UV region. So the first thing to note is that uh, there is a nice baseline region right at 500 nanometers. So what we can do here is peg that to zero because we don't want that to jump around. Notice if I can, I'm gonna kind of move the cuvette around a little bit. Well, I can't really see it too much. Oh, there you go. Yeah, see how I can like, by moving the cuvette, kind of move that around a bit. We don't want that to happen. So Let's go ahead and take a sub range and peg that to zero. Like we talked about, this is the equation that was built by the uh, wizard. So we're gonna go ahead and go to basic math. And I'm gonna actually turn this off for a second. So we're gonna go to, uh, I'm sorry, advanced math, array math, and do a sub range. Because this is, this multiplier block is the final absorbance output. All this is doing then is going into a unit labels node and then our graph output, which is right there. <coughs> Pardon me. So we're going to do a sub range of about 500 to 503 nanometers. We hit apply. Look at that. So now we can see <coughs> that's our, uh, Kind of, it's noisy, but that's an array value. If we were to make this the same value, note that it makes it a scalar, a single unit. Um, now that's important for the next thing we're going to do because the you can do mathematical processes on a scalar single value, but on a an array of values like this, you're going to have to reduce that down to a, a single value, and you can do that with an average block. So check this out. We're going to go ahead and connect that to an average block. 
And now this is the average of that 500 to 503 range. And this is what we want to subtract out from everything else, right? So let's go ahead and do basic math and subtract. And we're going to do our main feed minus that. And that's our new baseline corrected view. So let's get rid of this. If I can do that. And let's connect it to here. Bam. And notice that now this is pegged <coughs> to 500 uh, nanometers and it'll always stay there. So we can kind of clean up our, our view a little bit. There we go. Now, I had done before this um, some, so we can either use the 400 nanometer or something out here to do this uh, concentration uh, analysis. I had done this in Excel, so hopefully you can see this. Um, and this is showing uh, the different concentration levels, 30, 40, 60, and 80 grams per liter. And we get really nice growth here, just as, like textbook quality. And then we get this uh, classic plot showing absorbance versus concentration. And we get a really nice 0.9997 R squared linear fit. Perfect, right? Right out of a textbook. But this isn't what we really want. Um, this is great for your high school chemistry homework to do absorbance versus concentration, but we want the opposite of this. We want concentration versus absorbance because our input, our X value is going to be this and our output, we want to be concentration. That's our Y. So we know that 114.7 times the absorbance at 723, that was the correlation I had used right there, that's going to give us a really nice uh, nickel concentration value. So let's go ahead and build that in. So if we go ahead and take another subrange, so we're going to go to advanced math, array math, subrange, and we're going to do 723. So we're going to pull off of our baseline corrected feed. So let's just do 723 to 723. And that's our value right there, which is, you can see is 0.69 and then about 0.7 right there. So that's what we're looking for. Now we want to have a, our constant block. So let's do a constant. We said 114.7, if, if I recall, 114.7. And let's multiply those together. And zip those together. Let's add a, a label block. Now check this out. You can right click and also duplicate things that already exist. So I'm just going to duplicate that same unit block, bring that over there. And then one of our view options, you have graph, scalar, table, or a color view. We want a scalar value. So let's bring that and look at that. Now let's change these units because we don't, we don't want that. We want that to say NICL2 concentration and our the label there is grams per liter. Now that's great, except the units are, I mean, look at all those decimals. That looks pretty messy, right? So let's go in and clean that up. Let's go to unit precision, dial that down to maybe two. That looks a little better. All right, now there we go. Now we have a nickel chloride concentration monitor. Let's take some of our other, um, let's take some of our other uh, solutions here. Let's pop in uh, one of our 30. So here's a 30. Throw that in. Look at that, 29.6. Looks pretty good. Let's throw in one of our 40s. 39.98, 40 right there. Let's throw in one of our 60s. There's a 60. And there's 60. So now we're very quickly getting an answer about these solutions. Uh, that is very, you know, important for this nickel plating process so we can quickly, you know, adjust the dilutions. Now, real quick, let's say that uh, this is a, a, a good way if you've already done the analysis and you know what this coefficient is to put this in. But let's say that you have a huge, you've got like a huge calibration regression and it's updated very regularly. And you don't want to uh, deal with, um, you know, putting in just a constant value like this. So let's get rid of this. We're going to feed in. We're going to feed in a an external file. So check this out. This is a file uh, with those same values that I created. So this is only five points, but this could be 500 points. If you had a, a big uh, a calibration list, let's say of data. 
And we're going to feed this in using what's called the linear regression tool and the function evaluator. So one of our sources options is going to be, so we can do a data source. The black body simulator is really cool. We won't have time for that, but, but if you get a chance, play with that. Uh, and then the, what we're going to bring in is, is the file. So now let's go to advanced math, array math, and linear regression. Let's bring in that file we had mentioned. Hopefully it, uh, yeah, OV webinar. So that was our nickel cow. And see, that was that line that that the data set had, had characterized or drawn there. So that was the, the values from that file. We're going to bring it into a linear regression. And we're also going to bring in a an array map here, a function evaluator, evaluate function. We're going to bring that in. And before we connect these, I want to show you what this is going to do. So in the linear regression, you can set the order of this. First order is just linear, right? Or you can bring it up to nine, actually, nine order polynomial. So let's say we're fourth order. It's going to give do that fit and give you coefficients for all those. Or if you don't pig the uh, intercept to zero, it'll also give you a non-zero value for this first coefficient. But we want that. We want this to be down to one. And notice that we're back at 114.7, just like we had with our K block, right? So now if we plug this into here and this into here, let's see if we pop in our 60 again. Ta-da, there we go. So now think about what we've done here with this. We have successfully created a nickel chloride concentration monitor that has active baseline uh, correction built into it. So if there's any shifts in the optics or so on, it corrects for that. And the ability to load in an external calibration file here from a source that you may be updating with some other protocol in your process or whatnot. So you can build these very quick. And we did this in like 15 minutes. This would have been, you know, a bunch of money probably from a, a custom engineering firm if you had presented the same thing. But we want to give you the tools to do this, this stuff very easily yourself. Now, that is to say these are ideal solutions, right? These are very clean, perfect uh, nickel chloride and, and DI water. Now, in a real world scenario, there's going to be other stuff in there, things that sediment that causes turbidity, maybe other fluorophores and salts. In that case, that maybe you can't work it out yourself, or I'm sure you could, you're all very smart people. But uh, if you don't have the time, let's say, to work it out yourself, Ocean Insight also offers very advanced uh, it, machine learning, spectral machine learning, uh, what we call ocean intelligence, which is a platform that can deconvolute extremely complex mixtures, more than what you can even imagine. I mean, some of the demos get get crazy how, how good they are. So that's something to talk to us about if you uh, want to deconvolute or, or understand more about deeper complex uh, mixtures uh, of things. So. That's basically what we wanted to run through, but look at everything you can do in here. You have all your different bound options, uh, your time series, sources, as we said, um, filtering, all different types of filtering options. So there is a lot in here that you can build uh, and make massive schematics that automate. And then you can go in here, just like Yvette said yesterday, go in and save this as a project and it will load all this right back up. So now you have that tool built and ready to go.